All right, let's all stand this morning. Let's worship Him. The reason why we're here.
rescued you from your old sinful ways oh my goodness we just celebrated Easter the ultimate victory in our lives amen you're our source of life because you rose from the dead Jesus hallelujah praise your name just worship him this morning if you need rescue they can be your day.
it, Father Lord. We thank you so much. We rejoice, Lord God, and we exalt your holy name. This world does have nothing for us. Every time we go to the world, Lord, we come back, we come back disappointed. We come back less than what we were before. But when we come to you, Lord God, you make us new. You make all things different. You change us and you transform us. You take us from darkness to light. And we glorify your holy name and we worship you and we magnify you and we glorify you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are transcendent. You are sovereign. You are over all things, in control of all things. You are eternal. You are, have no beginning and you have no end. You are the Alpha and you are the Omega. Lord God, you never change. You're always the same. Your love is, is consistent. It is continual. It never, ever changes. You're not like us who one day we're committed and one day we're not. You're always faithful. You're always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And we glorify your holy name and we magnify you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we continue our worship with the taking of Holy Communion, when we're invited to come to the table of the Lord, again, as always, we must listen to the warning of the Apostle Paul. And we must do this with all reverence and all respect. Communion is not for those who have never accepted Christ. Communion is only for those who have committed, given their life to Christ, ask Him to be their Lord, and follow them according to His way and to His word. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 29, Paul issues us a warning. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. As always, we will take a time of evaluation to ensure first and foremost that we are actually children of God, that we have been saved by the blood and the work of Jesus Christ, and that we have committed to our life to following Him. But also that as we take this, we will remember. We will remember what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago on the cross. We will remember that as a Christian, we are a part of His body and His bride, the Church of Jesus Christ. And that we will remember that one day, hopefully very, very soon, hopefully today, Jesus will return and take us to be where He is forever and ever. So let's evaluate our heart, ensure that we do this in a worthy fashion, and place ourselves before God. Jesus, we thank you for all that you did. We thank you for the perfect life that you lived. We thank you for willingly going to the cross on our behalf. Thank you for taking our sin upon yourself and in return imparting to us your righteousness. We thank you that three days later you resurrected from the grave and that now you sit at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. We thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit who is always with us and we can say that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And I pray that you will bless these elements as we remember what you did. We remember what you made us. 
and we will remember that one day you will come receive us to yourself. Amen. Ushers, you can come. Again, when your heart is ready, you can come, coming from the outside, returning to the middle. Of course, the bread 
represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken on our behalf. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul continues, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. And then the juice or the wine. He continues and says, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we can never thank you enough. While we marked Easter Sunday last week, you're still alive. It's not something that we should just remember one day a year or one time a month. We should remember and think through the cross, through the resurrection, every day of our life. When we struggle with pride, we should think about how you humbled yourself and became a servant and took our sins upon yourself. When we want to be self-righteous, we can see that you, the perfect one, forgave us, the imperfect, the sinful. And I pray, Lord God, that the cross, your death, and your resurrection and ascension will never be out of our mind. And that every day we wake up, we will look to the heavens and hope today is the day that you come back for us. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Now, it is my understanding that our brother gave his life to Christ, so we have a new family member, and heaven is rejoicing. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> and I even got to preach yet. Awesome. I, you know, don't always assume I know what's going on. That's why I had to go ask, is, did he give his life to Christ? I'm so happy. The Bible says, brother, that the angels in heaven are rejoicing over what you did, and we celebrate. Hallelujah. Now, in a, in a coming soon, we're going to do a baptism. We were hoping to do that in fresh water at a lake somewhere, but I don't know if that's going to work out or not. One, I don't know if it's legal, <laughs> and I don't know if, uh, if there's a really a decent place to actually do it. So if not, we'll, we'll do it behind us, but uh, that would be the next step. We're going to continue our worship in the giving of tithes and offerings. And again, again we give. Uh, as a test of our trust in God, we give as a statement of thanks to God. We give an expression of our love for God. And we also give with the assurance that God's blessings will come to the obedient. Given to the Lord. Ushers, you can come. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you. And we rejoice with heaven that the lost has been found, that those in darkness have come to your light, and that we have a new family member and we glorify you, and we greatly thank you, Lord God, that your spirit can do that which none of us can do, that it is not a matter of the right words being put together. It's not a matter of, 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 of anything other than your spirit drawing and someone saying, yes, I need Jesus to save me. And we know that in you, God, Lord Jesus, that we can find life, find it more abundantly, that you can take any one of us, and we're all examples of have you pulled us out of the mire and brought us into your family. You not only forgave us, but you also adopted us as your children, and we give you all the glory. And as we were given to you, we pray, Lord God, that you'll bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. giving. Uh, we want to welcome you to Kincaid Church of God and those who are watching online. 
we want to welcome you as well. Uh, we encourage you to like, comment, and share so that more people in your friends list will be able to hear God's word. Uh, just an announcement since the offering was just taken. Uh, I didn't want to announce this during Easter. Uh, Easter service was just a little different, and I didn't want to do announcements. But you gave almost $600 for the youth facility in Serbia, and so we want to thank you for that. I'm really happy for that. Uh, and we will continue with that for our missions project number for the next couple of months. Just So I want to I want to really get that facility going, and I'm hoping, actually, I want to talk to Miroslav when they're here in July about possibly taking a short-term trip uh, there and maybe working in one of the camps for them. And so if you're interested in that, you can let me know. I, there's a few of you I really want to take because <laughs> I really like to leave you over there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I'm joking. No, I mean, it's... it's yeah, you do, you, you do come back more appreciative of our nation, but you also learn our shortcomings. In, in that part of the world, one thing that I learned as we lived there for, for quite some time and we worked extensively there, I learned what hospitality is. And uh, I always thought as a Southerner that we knew, you know, Southern hospitality. But when I was in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, in Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, I learned I had no idea what hospitality was. And, uh, so I, and I look forward to you to meet, meeting Meek and, and Blaja in July. They'll be here with us. I'm still kind of going back and forth if I should ask him to speak, just for understanding's sake. I'm not really sure. He's his, he, he, you know, just, uh, but we'll see and pray about it. But I also want to thank all those who came to the Good Friday service. We had a really good turnout. And also those who came to the Easter egg hunt. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and I also want to thank those who show up on Wednesday night. Uh, nothing says support to a pastor more than showing up. And I, I just want to thank you that that means a lot to me. I, I, I mean, I hope it's more for God than it is for me, but it does encourage me when people show up. Speaking of which, tonight at 6 p.m., <laughs> we will have our monthly prayer meeting here at the church. We try to keep it in one hour. And we pray for the needs of our church. We pray for the needs of our community, our country, and the world. And then we do have a time of uh, individual needs. And again, we're trying to keep this to one hour. But if you have to come and for some reason you have to leave early, that's fine. I, that, you'll never be, you should never be condemned for that. And I don't think you ever would be. Uh, but we do welcome you for that. Also on April 27th is the Walk for Life, which helps support the Loving Arms Pregnancy Center, the pro-life movement. And... It, uh, it will be at Kitchell Park, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, in Pena. Uh, there was an issue with a park in Taylorville where it couldn't be there this year. Uh, registration will start at 8.30 a.m. and the walk will start at 9 o'clock. And you can pick up sponsor sheets if you're going to walk uh, at the welcome desk after the service. Uh, on April 28th, okay, I don't necessarily like to make this announcement, uh, we will have Pastors Appreciation Day. Uh, we will be, this will be our third year as your pastors here in Kincaid. I mean, sometimes I'm, I can't believe how quickly it has went by, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and uh, there, there's a sign-up sheet, I mean, a sign-up on the church app or online so that you can sign up for the meal. And they just need to know that because this is a meal, one of the meals that we cater for the year, and they just need to know about how many we're going to have and one, one family member can sign up for the whole family on the church app. Now, if you don't have the church app uh, and you want it, you can talk to Carrie and she can tell you how to do that. Or if you don't do that kind of thing, you can let Carrie know and she will sign up for you. And so uh, that will be on April 28th. Actually, April 23rd will be exactly three years since we pulled into Kincaid. And I thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, honestly... Uh, I could not, in my life, I don't remember a better choice that I ever, uh, or the leading, or God, I guess, made a better choice for me and my family. And uh, so I, I, I do appreciate uh, that. Only thing that I ask for, and we talked about this in the Sunday school class, no foot massages, all right? Uh, one time my church in Dubai sent me and the pastor for a foot massage. It was the most miserable experience in my whole life. I mean, it's like, it hurt, it was painful, it was terrible. Okay, our memory verse this morning is Matthew 7, 21. 
and you'll get it as we go into the sermon. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Children, you can come forward. for our kids. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our children. We thank you for their life and for their soul. We thank you for all that's taking place downstairs, those who committed to teach them, and all that you're instilling in their heart. And I pray, Lord God, that they learn more about you, they learn how much you love them, and also, Lord, how to love you in return. And I just pray that their time will be blessed. In your name we pray. Okay, this morning we're going to continue our journey through the book of James, and uh, today we're going to talk about counterfeit faith. (laughs) Yeah, just wait. (laughs) You're going to groan a whole lot more in a few minutes. Uh, No, but let's pray the prayer that we pray as we enter the Word of God. Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me yourself with your word. Show me myself and show me my Savior, and make the book live to me. For Christ's sake, amen. Now today, the portion of James we're going to look at will be from chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 14 through 17. 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, it is amazing that you and I live in such a time that appears to be as dangerous as it is. I mean, at the close of the 20th century... There were many people who thought that we might be entering a time of relative safety in the 21st century. I mean, just 10 years before, the Cold War had ended. Nuclear disarmament was a common topic. The thought was that now was that the world was somewhat under control. That the things that we once feared perhaps had passed away and that we were headed for a safer world. And now, a quarter of the way, almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century, we all know that nothing is farther from the truth. In fact, the reverse seems to be true. We live in a world that is increasingly dangerous, and people live in fear as much now, if it's significantly not more than they did before. If you get online and you do a search on 21st century dangers, you will find an entire list of things to be afraid of and dangers that we face. You will see dangers of terrorism, both home and abroad, dangers of mass shootings, even in places once deemed safe, like schools and shopping malls and even churches. You will see wars popping up everywhere. The fear of nuclear holocaust has returned. World pandemics that have changed our way of life. Governments and leaders seeking to remove liberties that were once considered absolute and untouchable. Claims of destruction from climate change where either we're going to all freeze or we're all going to burn up. (laughs) World-ending events like being struck by some cosmic object from space. And then our borders are insecure and we don't even know what that means. And if one wasn't careful and we didn't have a Bible to read, and we didn't understand that God is sovereign over all the events of life on earth, then we might be tempted to curl up in a ball in a cave somewhere. Now the reason that I begin, and I bring all that up, just to start off with a really encouraging note, the reason I bring all that up 
as real as those dangers are, and as serious as they may be, both individually and corporately, they are nothing compared to the danger addressed by James in the verses we just read. They're nothing compared to that. And you might be thinking, what danger are you talking about? The danger of having a faith that is counterfeit, a fake faith, a faith that is false. Three times in 13 verses, James makes it very, very clear. In verse 17, he says, faith by itself is dead. Verse 20, faith without deeds is useless. Verse 26, faith without deeds is dead. And James, once again, is echoing the teachings and the words of his half-brother, Jesus. The, our memory verse for this morning, Matthew 7, 21, where Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. In other words, it is distinctly possible for you and I to be self-deceived in regards to our faith in Jesus Christ. And to be self-deceived in this area is of eternal significance and of eternal consequence. And James is not unique in saying this. I mean, as we just saw from Jesus' warning. But Paul also warns us of this possibility. In 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, he says, Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. In other words, Paul does not assume that everyone who claims to profess faith in Jesus is actually, actually has a true living faith in Christ. That just because a person claims to be a Christian, claims to be saved, that doesn't mean they really are. Now, you might be thinking, well, Vance, that's not very nice. That's not very kind. That's not very loving. But in actuality, it is extremely kind. It is extremely nice and especially loving. I mean, what would be more unkind and unloving? I mean, what would be unkind and unloving would be to have the assumption that everyone who claims to believe, everyone who claims to follow and trust in Jesus, just because at some, at some level they have interest or some involvement, to be kind and loving is to warn them that they are in danger and must wake up to that danger before it's too late. To allow them to stay deceived would not be kind and loving or nice. And if you remember in James chapter 1 and verse 22, James warned his readers that it was possible to hear the word of God, but to not obey it and thus deceive ourselves. That the danger of self-deception by showing up to church, listening to the word of God be preached, but then not doing or obeying the word of God, which is how James and the rest of the Bible defines a true believer. Then in verse 26, he warns those who consider themselves religious. And remember what that means in James, that religion is the outward expression of an inward reality. That if Jesus is inside of us, if Jesus is transforming us, there will be an outward expression of that. And he says that anyone who claims to be religious, considers himself religious, but does not control their tongue, does not have a compassionate heart, and doesn't have a clean, holy life, well, those people better test themselves again because maybe, likely, they are self-deceived. That just because we consider ourselves to be a Christian, that's not sufficient. That's not enough. Not at all. James, because he loves to those to whom he's writing, desperately desires to warn them of the very clear and present danger for them and for us as well. Now please, please never ever think that when I preach and I seek to push to allow God to examine your heart, that I push you to test yourself, that I push you to do all that you can to get closer and closer to Christ, never ever think that is from condemnation. 
Never think it's from anger or arrogance or that I just enjoy beating you up every Sunday. No. No. I do all of this, and I only do all of this because I dearly love you more than you could possibly know. And I don't want any of you to hear Jesus say to you, depart from me, I don't know you. I mean, daily I pray, God, don't let me lose one, not one. James continues in chapter 2 to warn them and to warn us that if we show favoritism, if we're a bunch of snobs, now that's my paraphrase, but that's basically what he's saying, that if we prefer people because of their wealth, because of their background, because of their intellect, because of their race or whatever, then we also need to take the test again. That just because you consider yourself a Christian, yet there's no evidence of the outward expression of the life of God that's in, supposed to be in you, then you are in a lot of danger. A lot of danger. And again, in our verses today, James goes even further in his warnings. In verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Now, it's very, very careful that we look and see what the Bible actually says, which is kind of what we're talking about on Wednesday night. And if you do use a King James Bible, in, in, in your version, it, this can be a little bit confusing there. Because he says, again, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? James is not setting faith against deeds here. Not at all. I mean, he's not doing that at all. But what kind of faith? Is he warning people about? Well, a counterfeit faith, a faith that is false, a fake faith. James is not talking about someone who you can obviously see and obviously tell that their faith is fake, that they're obviously not a Christian. That's not what James is talking about here. What, it's kind of like, I mean, most of you could probably remember this. I remember when I was a kid at Halloween, and uh, we had... I don't know if you remember those really, really, I mean, now they got like costumes that are all over and your feet and everything. I don't remember, when I was a kid, they just had those plastic masks. You remember those with the little rubber band on the back of them? And no matter what it was, whether it was Casper or Mickey or, or Bugs Bunny or whatever, you know, and you'd put that on and if, if the rubber band stayed and you went out to get some candy. No one actually ever believed I was Bugs Bunny. I mean, if they did, then they, 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 they were kind of in a different type of trouble. I mean, no one actually thought that. We weren't fooling anybody with those cheap plastic masks. James is not talking about someone who is obviously fake. James is addressing the real possibility and the real danger of those who appear to be Christian, who claim to be Christian, who resemble the real thing, but in truth, their faith is false. And fake. Another way to kind of explain it, there are people who go to sporting events. And for one reason or another, they decide not to get their tickets through the normal legal way, but they go try to get their tickets from scalpers. And sometimes they can be very happy that they got their tickets from scalpers and that they didn't go the right way to go about getting their ticket. And then they get to the stadium and they get in line and they stand in line, and then they finally get to the person who takes the ticket, and when the person takes the ticket, he looks at it and says, I think you need to come with me. And then they get in all kinds of trouble, and they're told you cannot enter the stadium because your tickets are counterfeit. Your tickets are false. And because they tried to get in the stadium using a fake ticket instead of going the legal and correct way. Now, you might be thinking, Vance, what in the world does that have to do with what James is talking about? Well, I'll tell you. If you or I think that we can present a counterfeit faith, a statement of faith that is false, at the entryway to heaven, and somehow it will be accepted, then you've not been reading your Bible. And you have deceived yourself. 
That's what makes what James is saying here so significant. That's why the danger is so very real. Well, I hope there is not anyone here who thinks because of your good deeds that you will find acceptance with God based on your good deeds. I hope there's no one here who thinks that. I hope we realize that being good and doing good deeds does not earn us acceptance before God. However, I do fear there are people in the church today who may be dangerously unaware of the possibility that they are taking refuge in a faith that is fake. That is not actually real. That is false. Now, I pray this is not the case, but I fear it may well be. Over 200 years ago, there was a pastor named John Newton. He described some people in his church. He said they showed up every Sunday morning. They wore the right clothes. They said all the liturgies. They sang the songs. They even put money in the offering plate. But when he preached the word of God, they listened with very little attention. They listened with very little affection unless he said something that exalted them or soothed their conscience. He said then they would respond with great enthusiasm. Now doesn't that sound amazingly like the church today? Again, this is 200 years ago, and this is, his, this is his words. He says, the thing I face week after week in my church is this. I have a large group of people who come. Many of them listen with very little attention and very little affection. The only way I can get them to listen is if I will exalt their self-esteem or I will seek to soothe their conscience. So in today's words... He's saying, if I will tell them they're great, and if I will tell them they're okay, then they get excited. Sound familiar? And if it doesn't, you haven't been listening to preaching very much in our country lately. Why are there churches this morning across the United States where 30,000 people have come to listen to the preaching? I'll tell you exactly why. Because the preaching says the same two things over and over and over again. You are great and you are okay. And James says, no, you're not. No, you're not. And if someone tells you you that you are, you better beware of that individual and you better take the test. What good is it if a man claims to have faith? And there is no evidence of that faith in his life. Can such faith save him from hell? Now those are rhetorical questions James asks us. And the answer is emphatically, no, it can't. And no, it won't. I mean, don't you see why it's so dangerous to be in a place where the whole truth of the Bible is being taught? Why it is so dangerous to be in a church where the pastor is making an honest attempt to preach the truth of Scripture. Where he's trying to explain that only on the basis of who Jesus is and only on the basis of what Jesus has done is there forgiveness and hope of heaven. Where the pastor tries hard to nudge and press and push souls under his care to trust in Jesus, to obey Jesus, to follow Jesus closely, to follow him and love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. I mean, do you realize that it is less significant, there's less significance in the rejection of the pagan than there is the lostness of one whose faith is fake or false, who just resembles the same thing. While hell will be indescribably horrible for the person who willfully and knowingly denies and rejects Christ, don't you think it'll be even worse for the one who gets to heaven, who expects to hear, well done, but surprisingly hears, depart from me, I don't know you. Now our discussion of Pastor Newton 200 years ago is not unique. Every generation of the church has had people in it with a false, fake, counterfeit faith. 
Remember, it was Jesus who said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter. Who taught about the sheep and the goats and how at the end they will be separated. Who taught about the wheat and the tares being separated and the tares be thrown into the fire. But here in our country, where churches inflate their church membership with vast numbers of people who claim to be in Christ just because at some point in their life they raise their hand or walk down the aisle, but those same people have no interest in the Bible, those same people only pray when they want something, those same people have no zeal or concern for their unsaved loved ones, their unsaved friends and their unsaved neighbors, those same people who have no desire whatsoever to live a holy life, who are basically the same as their non-Christian friends, what does the Bible say about that? A whole lot, including here in James, that their faith is fake, false, dead. But while this problem has existed since the church began, I do think the problem is multiplied today. I think especially when you consider the exposure to media, social media, the educational system, and the biblically weakened church today. Now there are three terms that you will often hear today used in media and other places concerning faith. Okay, Faith. You'll hear that word a lot, faith. Now three of those words are faith-based initiatives, faith community, and faith journey. You will hear those words a lot if you're actually listening. Now, faith-based initiatives, most of us have heard of. But we're told that these require everyone to have equal respect for every faith community. And that means we must be willing to listen to each faith community without reservation. And for each person to share their own faith journey. Now, in one sense, there's not a whole lot of alarm in that terminology. However, we must be willing to look past the surface and see what really lies underneath those terms. Underneath lies the notion that somehow or another, all faith should be accepted, that all faith should be embraced, and that all faith is equal, whatever that faith may be. Faith in whomever, faith in whatever, faith in faith itself. In other words, everything is valid and everything should be accepted on the basis and the notion of quote-unquote faith. But that's not, the, that's not the faith James is talking about. That's not the faith the Bible is talking about. What James is talking about, and when he talks about faith, he's referring to saving faith. Saving faith. Faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The confidence that while we have no basis on which to stand before God, but because of what God has done in Christ, and because we have come by His grace to trust in Him, that alone forms the basis of our acceptance to God. That alone. And it is our life and our lifestyle that gives evidence of that faith. That if we truly have faith, we are truly in Christ and Christ is in us, there will be evidence. Where the faith is real, the evidence will be real in one's life. Now, if you were here last week, we, had, we discussed about Paul standing trial before Festus and Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. And Paul is defending his faith before the Roman governor and in, in front of the king. And during his defense, we talked about that Festus interrupts Paul and says, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you insane. If you remember, Paul responds, I'm not insane. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. And then Paul brings the king in and says, the king is familiar with these things. And I can speak freely to him. Basically what Paul is saying is, Festus, if you don't want to listen to this, that's okay. I'm sure the king wants to hear it. I can speak to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice at all. Now, you might not be getting this, Festus, 
but the king, the king is able to follow me along in what I'm saying. Then Paul turns directly to the king and says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. You remember how the king responded? Paul, do you think in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? You see, Agrippa knew exactly what Paul was trying to do. Paul wasn't saying, do you believe in the prophets? Do you have some kind of faith? Terrific. Wonderful. That's great. Maybe you can have some faith-based initiatives in your kingdom. Maybe you can have a garden party and share your faith journey with other people and even establish your own faith community. No, that's not what Paul was saying at all. Agrippa understood what Paul was doing. I know what you're doing, Paul. You're trying to get me to believe in this Jesus. And Paul basically says, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. Why? Because there is no saving faith outside of Jesus Christ. And I want you and everyone I know to believe in him. That is why James recognizes, if I write to these people, if I write to these Christians... And they believe that simply because they have said the same words, that they've sang the same songs and do the same things, that somehow that makes them a Christian when they're really not. And James tells us later, he says, if I do that, one day I will answer to God on the day of judgment. And their blood and their souls will be on my hands. I mean, James loves, respects, and fears God. And he loves those to whom he's writing to. And I, you. Now, you might be thinking, Vance, when is the conclusion coming? Because this introduction is taking forever. Soon. Soon. But please understand, please understand, I must address this. I must. I must make it very very, very clear that the, uh, what the nature of saving faith really is. Why? Because one day I too will stand before God and give an account in what I have teached and what I have preached. So what does it mean to have real faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ? Well, first, I'm going to talk about what faith is not. It is not the intellectual acceptance of certain propositions, of certain things about Jesus. That is not saving faith. The propositions about Jesus in and of themselves, responded to mentally or intellectually, does not equal saving faith. Saving faith is essentially the entrustment of one's life to the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior resulting in a life of commitment and faithfulness. Saving faith is not the belief that one has been saved. Saving faith is not even the belief that Christ died for us. It is the commitment of oneself to Christ as unsaved, as lost, as helpless, and an undone, and one who needs to be saved. The only thing that you and I bring to our salvation is the sin in which we need to be forgiven of. We have nothing else to bring. We come empty-handed. We come to Jesus Christ and say, I'm lost. I'm helpless. I'm undone. I need a Savior. What James is talking about here is when we entrust ourselves to the Lord Jesus, we offload our sin and we discover His forgiveness. And not only does he forgive us, he then provides us the Holy Spirit in order to live our life his way, to produce fruit in our life, to live in obedience. So that, that the grace of God that brings salvation teaches us to say no to all ungodliness, Paul writes, and teaches us how to live in a way that pleases God. And our lifestyle is evidence of that salvation. Our lifestyle is not what saves us, but it is evidence 
that Christ has saved us. What James is saying in regards to faith and deeds, he said, what good is it if someone walks around saying, I have faith, I have faith, I'm a Christian, but there's no evidence of that in their life? Can that faith save? Of course not. This is one of the reasons why Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Because those who are wealthy have a hard time admitting they're lost. They have a hard time admitting they're undone, they're helpless, and they cannot save themselves. So again, let me clarify this as much as I possibly can. Do not mistake some general acknowledgement of God's existence or even truth about Jesus as evidence of saving faith. Because you say you believe and prayed and raised your hand at one time? Because if you will look ahead at verse 19, and we're not going that far, but if you look at her, verse 19, it tells you, even the demons believe. So just because you, you believe that God is real and that Jesus actually did what he said, that doesn't make you any different than the Bible says than a demon. Until you actually entrust yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. You give him your life. He becomes your Lord and your Savior. And you follow him and you obey him the best you can. And with empowerment that he's given you through the Holy Spirit. And live your life according to his way and his word. That is the evidence that comes. Now what you need to be doing is not simply agreeing with the truth about Jesus but also consenting to obey, to follow, to serve him. This, mean, this is what it means to have real faith. This is what the Bible means to truly believe. I don't know if you learned about this in Sunday school, but I did. You can go ahead and put it up on the screen. Faith. And what does faith kind of mean? Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's saving faith. You can have the world and everything in it. I want Jesus. I surrender everything. He can have everything I own. He can have my life. He can have my will. Everything is his. I trust Christ. Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking everything, all my good deeds, all my bad deeds, all my best attempts, my worst attempts, all my accomplishments, all my failures, all my possessions, everything I have, all, of, all that I am, I give to him. Forsaking all of that, I trust, follow, obey Jesus Christ. No matter the consequences, no matter what it means, no matter if I'm not popular, no matter if the world doesn't like me, no matter what they call me, a bigot or whatever they want, I am going to follow Jesus because he has given me saving faith. And when that happens, when that happens, when we truly have saving faith and we truly have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and we truly believe in him and it, it is evident that we're following him, James summarizes it beautifully back what we've already talked about in, in chapter 1, verse 18. He chose to give us birth. Again, that, if you remember, that's God's initiative. He chose to give us birth. That's God's initiative through the word of truth. That's God's instrument that we might be, be a kind of first fruits of all he created. God's intention. Intention. What is his intention? To make us like Jesus. That is God's intention. God didn't save you so that you could go up and walk on streets of gold and have an eternal vacation. He saved you to make you what you were originally created to be and to become more like Jesus, display his character and his nature, and to worship him and to serve him with all your heart. And where there is real faith, there will be real evidence. There will be real evidence. So in your life, the question you have to ask, is there evidence? Now, Remember, the person that we deceive more than anyone else is ourself. So it might be good to ask someone else, do you see evidence of the saving faith of Christ in me? You say, who should I ask? Maybe start with your spouse. 
Maybe start with your kids, your coworkers, your boss, your neighbors. What would they say if you were to ask them, do you see the evidence of the saving faith of Jesus Christ in my life? What would they say? Now, we're not talking about perfection, and we're not talking about completion. We're talking about the indication that there is life, and that life reveals itself in how we live. It only makes sense. Again, the words of Jesus in Matthew 7 really, really strike hard. Starting in verse 16, by their fruit, you will recognize them. What does that mean? There will be evidence. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, By their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. All right? I have another visual aid today. This is two weeks in a row. I haven't done this in like 26 years, and now I've done it twice in a row. If you don't know, this is a walking stick. And I saw this in my office, and I thought, okay, it kind of connects. Mackenzie had borrowed it for something in children's church, and I figured she was using it for a pole vault. And uh, (laughs) sorry, couldn't help myself. (laughs) Do you see any fruit from that? Do you think fruit can come from that? I mean, to look for fruit on it is kind of a pointless thing, huh? Now, I could have taken some grapes and kind of, you know, taped them on here and tell you that these grapes came forth from this stick, and you'd probably say, Pastor, I don't think your medication is working as good as you hope. I mean, it's dead. There is no possibility of fruit coming from it. None at all. It's dead. If your life looks like this, can such faith save you? If your life looks like this, no matter what you say, no matter what you claim, you're going to be thrown into the fire. Now those are the same words of the one who hung on the cross. Jesus said those words. Not some preacher, not some, you know, hellfire and brimstone evangelist. Jesus said that. If your life looks like this, I will throw you into the fire. If your life looks like this, you need a savior. You can't have it one way or another, faith or deeds. It's both or neither. Hopefully that's my last visual aid. It's it's both and, not either or. Faith or deeds, it must be both. Faith and deeds or your faith is false, fake, not real counterfeit God's judgment will be executed on sin it will be punished God's mercy is revealed in Jesus Christ who bore that punishment for those who truly believe and James tells us if your life looks like that stick I don't really care what you say if a man or a woman claims to have faith and their life looks like that can such faith save The answer is absolutely not. 
This is why I say you're in the most dangerous place in the world this morning. And you could be in the most dangerous position of your life. Not terrorism or all the other things I mentioned. The danger in this world is that you and I would die and go to hell. That's the only thing, only thing you need to fear. That we could die and go to hell. But let that fear drive you to Christ. Let it drive you to Christ. And he will fill you with his spirit. And he will enable you to become the person he wants you to be. The person he created you to be. The very best version of yourself. Now again, I'm not telling you this because I'm angry at you. Not because I want you to feel bad or guilty. Not because I'm condemning you. Not because I think I'm better than you. I'm telling you. Because I love you. And I don't want anyone to hear, I don't know you. You see, James is, James is not saying, if you have a controlled tongue, if you have a compassionate heart, if you have a clean life, then on the basis of that, you're acceptable to God. That's not what James is saying. He's saying, if you have experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit is living in you and transforming you and changing you little by little that you will have those things he will help you control your tongue he will produce in you a compassionate heart he will clean up your life James is saying there will be evidence. There will be evidence. There will be fruit. What is the basis of our acceptance with God? What Jesus has done. What is the evidence of that acceptance? What we've been talking about this morning. Let's pray, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray for our sister. You know what's happening. You know what's going on. You know all things. You see all things. And in the power of your name, we ask for your touch right now. In Jesus' name, that you will touch her body from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, whatever it is. And in Jesus' name, set things right. We pray and we trust in you. In your name, amen. One twenty Market Street.
we'll go ahead and dismiss. Uh, we'll pray, and then uh, just do keep Rita in prayer today, and we'll update you uh, as we know something. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you again for your, your love and your grace. And again, we pray for our sister. Ask for your hands to be upon her and just uh, touch her. Uh, again, you, you know all things. You control all things. You are sovereign over all things. And we give her to you, trusting in you uh, to touch her and to uh, let everything be all right. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.